Welcome students to lecture five of MHHS 1. I want to pick up where the last lecture ended about the different kinds of knowledge that lead to a fuller understanding of health and disease. Last time, we talked about how the intractable and fuzzy pictures of trauma, sociality, solidarity, gender difference, and unfamiliar indigenous healing practices were all es essential in prompting calls for medical science to study subjects it may not be disciplinary, con disciplinarily conditioned to study. So these calls were taken up by Stephen Porges, Shelley Taylor, and Peter Levine, just to name a few. One of the mandates of our MHHS program is to be interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary because knowledge structures have so often been siloed into discrete departments that rarely talk to each other. So what I wanna to present uh, to you uh, in this introductory course to MHHS is the incredible disciplinary diversity of our scholarly collective right here at UCR. So um, just to recap a little bit, in the first two lectures, we visited the creative writing department through Emily Rapp Black's piece, Proof of Loss. And in the next two lectures, we visited the Hispanic Studies Department through uh, Rocio Pichon Riviere's uh, comic, the, Neurobiolo the, the Neurobiology of Protest. Um, so now we've arrived at UCR's Department of Theater, Film, and Digital Production, TFDP, with Annika Spear's essay, incorporating activist-oriented theater into the feminist studies classroom. Now, the bonus here is that this piece will give you a preview of a course you might take in TFDP for the MHHS program. Hopefully, this preview will get you excited about the courses to come. Uh, in this first lecture, I'll be doing the usual thing of making sure we just have a firm understanding of the argumentative stakes of the piece, um, and then only after that, in the, in the next lecture, I'll be exploring more in depth how the lessons we've learned from this piece can show up in our own work and our own activism. The first thing that we must understand to appreciate this essay fully, I think, is Spears' use of the phrase embodied performance. Right? It, might be, it might be unclear as to what this means, and I just want to spend some time with it. This phrase shows up in the very first paragraph and is defined and developed gradually throughout the essay. So she states the thesis very clearly and very programmatically for maximum clarity. Um, and this is a quote. In this article, I will use my recent process of staging Jane Abortion and the Underground with Middlebury students in a gender, sexuality, and feminist studies course as a lens to examine how incorporating embodied theatrical performance into the classroom can contribute to students' feminist studies learning and deepen their understanding of reproductive justice." End quote. So in this very first paragraph, um, the very first paragraph just states the problem. And one very effective solution with the lucidity of a powerful call to action. The stakes are immediately sky high, I think, because of the difficult topic of reproductive justice activism. So from the beginning, Speer acknowledges just how difficult teaching reproductive justice can be. She compares it to, quote, rolling Sisyphus's boulder up the hill. And just in case that's, a, that's just a reference you don't get, um, she's referring to an, the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus, who was cursed by the god of the underworld Hades to roll a boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down in an infinite loop of useless labor. So again, the stakes are sky high, right? Uh, but activism can frequently be fruitless. Um, it could be considered one step forward and one step back, like Sisyphus's case. So in this essay, she offers one hopefully representative instance in which activist-oriented theater finally pushed that boulder of reproductive justice activism over that hill. It was an unusual confluence of interdisciplinary imaginings that produced this weird success story. Um, so she wants us to be very, she wants to be very careful in just walking us through this. Um, so it wasn't just a gender, sexuality, and feminist studies course, uh, GSFS, 
Um, it wasn't just a theater production of an old unpublished play at Middlebury College, a small liberal arts college in Vermont. So it was something uh, much more dynamic, more integrated, and more complex than that. It was an undertaking that produced in students um, a, uh, an unexpected appreciation for history, for dramaturgy, and intersectional feminisms. So, it's important to nail down exactly what Spear means by the successful practice of embodied performance. Um, so if you turn to page 38, she throws a bunch of citations at us to Bell, Kutzia, Spry, Goldstein, and Winner, Merlin, Blair, Drinko, and Kemp, um, all of which you're welcome to follow up on uh, by looking these sources up from Spear's reference list at the end. Um, but what's interesting to note here in this lecture is that this is apparently a well-trodden area of research in theater studies. Spear notes that, quote, significant theater studies scholarship identifies embodied performance as a site of pedagogy, epistemology, and research. So just to break those three things down, it teaches us how to teach, that's the pedagogy part, and it shows us uh, why and how to produce uh, new knowledge about subjects like reproductive justice, and that's the epistemology and research part of it. So, but, but this essay is not so interested in nailing down a precise theoretical definition of embodied performance, um, hence the deferral to the host of other scholars on that subject. Again, go see that reference list. Uh, that paragraph is remarkably short. What's more important to Spear in this piece is to define by practical examples um, what embodied performance is. So what follows in the rest of the example, uh, what follows in the rest of the essay are examples of how the lived experience of bodies transforms a performance and how the process of putting together a performance transforms how we live in those bodies. Again, the clarity in the call to activist action is the goal here. And examples in practice um, are usually more illuminating than a complicated theory of embodied performance. One of those highlighted examples is the transformative intergenerational interaction of the class with Paula Kamen, the author of the unpublished docudrama, Jane. The central conflict here arises in the student's discomfort with the ending in which the characters all, basically just all identify themselves as mothers. In the really telling citation of Ursula K. Le Guin, Spear explains what this older generation of feminists fighting for reproductive rights looked like. It was a historical event, Spear notes, quote, from the 1960s, 1970s, comprised of interviews conducted with women in the 1990s, written and rewritten in the 2000s, and staged with students in 2020. So this span of half a century would definitely expose disagreements and disjunctions. On Cayman's side, she was trying to capture the argument of the Jane Collective in the 1970s. They were an underground abortion service that prioritized the idea of motherhood as part of the feminine experience. Um, as the citation of Le Guin captures, the argument for reproductive freedom was so that women could become good mothers when they were ready to. Um, and go see that citation of Le Guin. Abortion then, is really not about saving children uh, and uh, the, uh, abortion then is really about saving children and not eliminating them. So now, since most of you are closer to this generation of students in 2020, you might have experienced the same level of pushback as they did. Those students at Middlebury College felt that the emphasis on motherhood was quote, reductive rather than expansive. So originally, Cayman was resistant to allowing any kind of change to the ending about motherhood because it was actually historically accurate to claim that their argument, uh, the Jane Collective's argument, uh, was that pro-choice doesn't mean anti-motherhood. Uh, to, to end on that note about reproductive freedom being pro-motherhood reflected accurately, for Cayman again, the struggle in the 1970s for abortion rights. So that's Paula Cayman's side. On the student side, they had a much broader conception of womanhood beyond the biological essentialism of motherhood. Gen Z, as Spear notes, is the queerest and most diverse generation. So it'd be strange to have a kind of 
disembodied performance of essentialized motherhood on the stage in 2020. In uh, Carly Thompson's GSFS course at uh, Middlebury College, Students were learning all sorts of things. They were learning about intersectional feminism that embraced queer theory and critical race studies. 19 of the 28 students identified as LGBTQIA. This centering of womanhood as motherhood was challenging to put onto the stage as a truly embodied performance. But um, it wasn't uh, it also wasn't a one-way conversation that got came in to back down from her old-fashioned notions of feminism. Frequently, as Speer points out, quote, young women who identify as activists for racial justice, social justice, and or environmental justice causes have been less focused on abortion. As such, language that highlights protecting the Roe decision feels too archaic, antiquated or not future-oriented enough to engage them. In other words, there might be the feeling that abortion was the touchstone issue of an older generation of feminists, and that there are now more important issues um, nowadays and, and, and in the future. Well, um, after the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe in 2022, we know that these students in 2020 might have been a tad complacent themselves. Uh, the passage of time doesn't always mean straightforward progress, and the embodied performance of the docudrama was able to show uh, to both Cayman and to the students um, the changing stakes of reproductive activism. Spears' essay ends with post-production interviews with some of the students involved in the staging of Jane, both um, on stage and off stage. First, we hear from Zoe, the actor who played Heather Booth, the founder of the Jane Collective. By engaging with the history of the Jane Collective, Zoe was able to realize what she called, quote, the cyclical nature of history, um, and how she came to reject easy progress narratives about how enlightened we are now compared to the past. By embodying the character of Heather Booth, Zoe had to imagine herself in the position of fighting uh, of a woman fighting for abortion when it was truly illegal, when there was no precedent at all to even talk about its constitutionality. The decisions that Zoe made in 2020 were vastly different from those made by Heather Booth in the 1970s. Then we hear from Allegra, who played Dr. C, uh, who has to perform an abortion procedure on stage. Um, now, we hear from Allegra that the sheer physicality of the role, adjusting sheets and scraping, made something in the distant past concrete and visceral for her. Rather than just reading about abortion procedures in the past, she had to go through the basic motions herself. She had to mimic those scraping motions with her own arms. Now, that allowed Allegra to see her historical privilege having never been exposed to the tangible, physical, concrete struggles of establishing an underground abortion clinic and actually performing abortions. She could say, theoretically, that we are past all of that now and we should focus on more important issues for the future. But as, as she, quote, focused on adjusting the sheet and scraping, she couldn't, she couldn't just gloss over this historical moment so easily. All right, third, next. We hear from Ivy, who performed a minor role on stage um, and, and helped out backstage as well. Now she had to make costume, she had to make decisions about costuming and light, lighting. And her realization was also about the physical materiality of the past, just like Allegra. When they dressed a woman as a typical 1970s housewife, Ivy immediately felt the rush of preconceptions. Quote, it's so easy to brand people and assume that if you're in this certain box, you can't do something ridiculously radical. As she was looking at the housewife costume, she could only assume that the character was raising children, doting on her husband with an after-work co cocktail prepared at five o'clock, preparing all the meals, and cleaning the house. In 2020, she couldn't imagine a housewife being a radical activist. 
Just the basic act of costuming characters allowed her to see that activism can come in strange and unlikely forms. So here we have three student interviews, and these three student interviews all allow Spear to draw conclusions about pedagogy, about how to teach the past to students who might think it dead and uninteresting. Now, this is a struggle in medical science as well. Frequently, medical research is approached with no regard for the deep-seated problems of history. Um, now, recall Zoe's, um, Zoe's point. The progress narrative that Zoe was talking about is an undeniably attractive one in scientific research. We always seem to be moving on technologically. The latest smartphone is better than the last one, for example. And the latest thing is always the greatest thing. As we now know, however, the history of science and medicine has never been about uninterrupted progress. And again, review the previous lectures for some of those examples. This kind of techno-optimism has led to racist and gender-biased experimentation. It has led to eugenic notions of human flourishing, and it has led to racial hygiene. So the latest thing isn't always the greatest. Instead, embodied performance is Spears' way to have us experience the physicality and materiality of a historical moment, to assess our moral and ethical judgments, and to critique our unexamined assumptions about human life.